Well, this is 2009, and it's the bicentenary of Charles Darwin. And all over the world, eminent evolutionists are anxious to celebrate this. And what they're planning to do is to enlighten us on almost every aspect of Darwin and his life and how he changed our thinking. I say almost every aspect because there's one aspect of this story which they have thrown no light on and they seem anxious to skirt around and step over it and talk about something else. So I'm going to talk about it. It's the question of why are we so different from the chimpanzees? We get the geneticists keeping on telling us how extremely closely we are, hardly any genes of difference, very, very closely related. And yet, when you look at the phenotypes, there's a chimp, there's a man, there's astoundingly different, no resemblance at all. I'm not talking about airy-fairy stuff, about culture or psychology or behavior. I'm talking about ground-based, nitty-gritty, measurable physical differences. There, that one is hairy and walking on four legs. That one is a naked biped. Why? I mean, <laughs> then, if I'm a good Darwinist, I've got to believe there's a reason for that. If we change so much, something must have happened. What happened? Now, 50 years ago, that was a laughably simple question. Everybody knew the answer. They knew what happened. The answers to the apes stayed in the trees. Our ancestors went out onto the plain. That explained everything. We had to get up on our legs to peer over the tall grass or to chase after animals or to free our hands for weapons. And we had got so overheated in the chase that we had to take off that fur coat and throw it away. Everybody knew that for generations, but then in the 90s, something began to unravel. The paleontologists themselves looked a bit more closely at the accompanying microfauna that lived in the same time and place as the hominids, and they weren't savannah species. And they looked at the herbivores, and they weren't savannah herbivores. And then they were so clever, they found a way to analyze fossilized pollen. Shock horror. The fossilized pollen was not of savanna vegetation. Some of it even came from lianas, those things that dangle in the middle of the jungle. So we're left with a situation where we know that our earliest ancestors were running around on four legs in the trees before the savanna ecosystem even came into existence. This is not something I've made up. It's not a minority theory. Everybody agrees with it. Professor Tobias came over from South Africa and spoke to University College London. He said, everything I've been telling you for the last 20 years, forget about it. It was wrong. We've got to go back to square one and start again. It made him very unpopular. They didn't want to go back to square one. I mean, it's a terrible thing to happen. You've got this beautiful paradigm. You've believed in it from generations. Nobody has questioned it. You've been constructing fanciful things on top of it, relying on it to be as solid as a rock, and now it's whipped away from under you. What do you do? What does a scientist do in that case? Well, we know the answer because Thomas S. Schoon um, wrote a seminal treatise about this back in 1962. He said, what scientists do when a paradigm fails is, guess what? They carry on as if nothing had ever happened. <laughs> if they haven't got a paradigm, they can't ask the question. So they say, yes, it's wrong, but supposing it was right. We... <laughs> and the only other option open to them is to stop asking the questions. So that is what they have done now. That's why you don't hear them talking about just yesterday's question. Some of them have even elevated it into a principle, so what we ought to be doing. Aaron Filler from Harvard says, isn't it time we stop talking about selective pressures? I mean, why don't we talk about, look, there's chromosomes and there's genes and recall what we see. Charles Darwin must be spinning in his grave. He knew all about 
that kind of science, and he called it hypothesis-free science, and he despised it from the bottom of his heart. And if you're going to say, I'm going to stop talking about selective pressures, you can take the origin species and throw it out of the window, because it's about nothing else but selective pressures. And the irony of it is that this was one occasion of a paradigm collapse where they didn't have to wait for a new paradigm to come up. There was one waiting in the wings. It had been waiting there since 1960, when Alistair Hardy, a marine biologist, said, I think what happened, perhaps our ancestors had a more aquatic existence for some of the time. He kept it to himself for 30 years, but then the press got hold of it and all hell broke loose. <laughs> All his colleagues said, this is outrageous. You re exposed us to public ridicule. You must never do that again. <laughs> and at that time, it became set in stone. The aquatic theory should be dumped with the UFOs and the Yetis as part of the lunatic fringe of science. Well, I don't think that. I think that Hardy had a lot going for him. I'd like to talk about just a handful of what have been called the hallmarks of mankind, the things that make us different from everybody else, and all our relatives. Let's look at the naked skin. It's obvious that most of the things we think about that have lost their body hair, mammals with our body hair, are aquatic ones, like the gugong, the walrus, the dolphin, the hippopotamus, the manatee, and a couple of wallowers in mud like the um, babirusa. And you're tempted to think, well, perhaps, could that be why we are naked? I suggested that people said, no, 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 look. I mean, look over about the elephant. You've forgotten all about the elephant, haven't you? So back in 1982, I said, well, perhaps the elephant had an aquatic ancestor. Peals of merry laughter. That's crazy woman. She's off again. She'll say anything, won't she? But by now... Everybody agrees that the elephant had an aquatic ancestor. They've come round to agree that all those naked pachyderms had aquatic ancestors. The last stop out was the rhinoceros. Last year in Florida, they found extinct ancestors of the rhinoceros and said, seems to have spent most of its time in the water. So this is a close connection between nakedness and water. As an absolute connection, it only works one way. You can't say all aquatic animals um, are naked because look at the sea otter. But you can say that every animal that has become naked has been conditioned by water in its own lifetime or the lifetime of its ancestors. I think this is significant. The only exception is the naked Somalian mole rat, which never puts its nose above the surface of the ground. Then take bipedality. Here you can't find anybody to compare it with. Um, because we're the only animal that walks upright on two legs. But you can say this. All the apes and all the monkeys are capable of walking on two legs if they want to for a short time. There's only one circumstance in which they always, all of them, walk on two legs, and that is when they're wading through water. Do you think that's significant? David Attenborough thinks it's significant as the possible beginning of our bipedalism. Look at the fat layer. We have got under our skin a layer of fat all over. Nothing in the least like that in any other primate. Why should it be there? Well, they do know that if you look at other aquatic mammals, the fat that in normal land animals is deposited inside the body wall, around the kidneys and the intestines and so on, has started to migrate to the outside and spread out in a layer inside the skin. In the whale, it's complete. No fat inside at all, all in blubber outside. We cannot avoid the suspicion that in our case, it started to happen. We have got skin lined with this layer. It's the only possible explanation of why humans, if they're very unlucky, can become grossly obese in, in a way that would be totally impossible for any other primate, physically impossible. Something very odd about our fat layer, never explained. The question of why we can speak. We can speak, and the, and the gorilla can't speak. Why? Nothing to do with his teeth or his tongue or his lungs or anything like that. Purely to do uh, with its 
conscious control of its breath. You can't even train a, a gorilla to say, ah, on request. The only creatures that have got conscious control of their breath are the diving animals and the diving birds. It was an absolute precondition for our being able to speak. And then again, there's the fact that we are streamlined. Try to imagine a diver diving into water, hardly makes a splash. Try to imagine a gorilla performing the same maneuver. And you can see that compared with gorilla, we are halfway to being shaped like a fish. I'm trying to suggest that for 40 odd years, this aquatic idea has been miscategorized as lunatic fringe, and it is not lunatic fringe. And the ironic thing about it is that they are not staving off the aquatic theory to protect a theory of their own, which they're all agreed on and they love. There is nothing there. They're staving off the aquatic theory to protect a vacuum. <laughs> now then. <laughs> How do they react when I say these things? One very common reaction I've heard about 20 times is, but it was investigated. They conducted a serious investigation of this at the beginning when Hardy put forward his article. I don't believe it. For 35 years, I've been looking for any evidence of any incident of that kind, and I've concluded that that's one of the urban myths. It's never been done. I ask people sometimes, and they say, well, of course, I like the quarter theory. Everybody likes the aquatic theory. Of course, they don't believe it, but they like it all the same. <laughs> Why do you think it's rubbish? They say, well, everybody I talk to says it's rubbish, and they can't all be wrong, can they? The answer to that loud and clear is yes, they can all be wrong. History is strewn with occasions when they've all got it wrong. <laughs> And if you've got a scientific problem like that, you can't solve it by holding a head count and saying, more of us say yes and say no. <laughs> Apart from that, some of the heads count more than others. Some of them have come over. There was Professor De Bias, he's come over. Daniel Dennett, he's come over. Sir David Attenborough, he's come over. Anybody else out there? Come on in, <laughs> the water's lovely. <laughs> And now we've got to look to the future. Ultimately, one of three things is going to happen. Either they will go on for the next 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. Yeah, well, we don't talk about that. Let's talk about something interesting. That would be very sad. The second thing that could happen is that some young genius will arrive and say, I've solved it. It was not the savannah. It was not the water. It was this. No sign of that happening either. I don't think there's a third option. So the third thing that might happen is a very beautiful thing. If you look back at the early years of the last century, there was a standoff and a lot of bickering and bad feeling between the believers in Mendel and the believers in Darwin. It ended with a new synthesis. Darwin's ideas and Mendel's ideas blending together. And I think the same thing will happen here. You get a new synthesis. Hardy's ideas and Darwin's ideas will be blended together, and we can go forward from there and really get somewhere. That would be a beautiful thing. It would be very nice for me if it happened soon. <laughs> Because I'm older now than George Burns when he said, was when he said, at my age, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's going to come and it's going to happen, what's holding it up? I can tell you that in three words. Academia says no. They decided in 1960, that belongs with the UFOs and the Yetis, and it's not easy to change their minds. 
The professional journals won't touch it with a barge pole. The textbooks don't mention it. The syllabus doesn't mention even the fact that we're naked, let alone for, look for reason to it. Horizon, which takes its cue from the academics, won't touch it with a barge pole. So we never hear the case put for it, except in jocular references to people on a lunatic fringe. I don't know quite where this diktat comes from. Somebody up there is issuing the commandment, thou shalt not believe in the quadratic theory. And if you hope to make progress in this profession and you do believe it, you better keep it to yourself because it will get in your way. So I get the impression that some parts of the scientific established are sort of morphing into a kind of priesthood. But you know, that makes me feel good because Richard Dawkins has told us how to treat a priesthood. <laughs> he says, firstly, you've got to refuse to give it all the excessive awe and reverence that it's been trained to receive. Right, I'll go ahead with that. And secondly, he says, and you must never be afraid to rock the boat. I'll go along with that too. Thank you very much.